Here we go. Welcome, Dan. Good to see you again, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me again. Hopefully we're going to do this weekly just to bring people up to date on what's what in the heck is going on. You know, that's the plan because there's so much going on this weekend in particular. I, you know, it's, I've got reservations to go camping at Lost Dutchman State Park. And then, and then I, I, I made a mistake of saying, you know, we might not get to go to the state park because of the, sh if there's oh, a shutdown yeah. and I go, yeah. oh no, wait a minute. Now it's a state park. They would close the Grand Canyon, but they won't yeah. close the state park. So it just, those little things that they do over there in Washington, DC that j just screw up your world. Yeah, so. I know I've, I had a laundry list of, I just did my video and posted it this morning and uh, I'm, I'm trying to get bullet points and it's easy. I hate to say it that way. <laughs> you got government shutdown. You have student loan payments coming back due. You have inflation, which is, you know, is here and has been here for a while. Some of the highest rates that we've seen in a long, long time. And then when I did do my uh, report this morning, I, it was kind of intriguing because I went to Zillow. And a lot of people are like, oh, Zillow's information is just terrible because they're realtors and everything else. But you go through there. Hartford, Connecticut is up almost 10% this year in home values. And then you go flip on the other side and you have Austin, Texas down 10%. It's like, so it really matters where you live. And that's what I've been trying to tell everybody for the last two years. It's like, okay, you know, parts are crashing, but they've solved, you know, a hundred percent appreciation in four or five years. So, you know, it's really relative to where you live. So when you start hearing, you know, if, if you're in Oklahoma and you're you're hearing the San Francisco data, you could just go, because it's irrelevant. You hate to say yeah. that. But yeah. And, and uh, you know, when you go back and look, um, I had a gentleman share with me the uh, um, St. Louis Fed data on, on uh, median home prices. Mm -hmm. And he goes, this, it's going straight down. How come? I mean, to me, that tells me we're already in a crash. And I go, well, hold on, let me look. Because I went into our data and it, St. Louis was only the second quarter. They didn't have the third quarter in there yet, where third quarter we turned up. But um, we turned up in Arizona and we we came down harder in Arizona and Nevada than, than what you see on the national average. Got it. Um, but if you just look at the chart and it looks like it's a, straight down but then you actually look at the numbers behind it it wasn't as big of a decline because like i went back to 2008 we were down 53 percent from peak to troll right and Values. so we were only down like 17 percent for that brief period but then we came back up and now we're up year to date so you're talking values yeah yeah got it yeah so it's yeah i know the number of homes is just it's ridiculous there's just nothing. And, you know, most of our applications coming in now, people are, are building houses. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing here. And the number of listings that we have are finally starting to climb, though. And it's really, um, but it's not climbing by much. We went up new listings, went up by about 100 today, um, which, you know, look at that. I mean, when did 100 homes really I matter know. in a market? How's your market normally seasonality? Uh, what do you usually see this time of year? Do you have the snowbirds coming in and trying to buy up or do you have kind of a lull in sales or is it just normally is your market? See here in Illinois, I'm in Chicago. People don't buy in December, January when you have the holidays and two, it's just too damn cold. <laughs> you yeah, know, well, I mean? October picks up, uh, but it's not picking up this year and it picks up for the opposite of what you just said. Cause somebody made a comment this morning goes, I'm seeing a lot more open house signs. I go, yeah, cause it's not 115. Um, you know, you, you can oh, actually walk around and put out open house signs without dying. And so in October, it just, I, October's beautiful out here, Dan, especially in Sedona. Really? That's, that's their wedding season up there. You can count on it being 80 degrees and beautiful and lots of scenery. And so seasonally October has a pretty decent real estate market because people are buying and selling before Thanksgiving, you know, want to get them at Thanksgiving. Right. But we're just like everybody else in November, December, whether snowbirds are arriving in or not, it's, it's dead. Right. And, uh, but our listing, our contract activity right now is, is as low as it's ever been. I mean, it's 2,400 every seven days and it hasn't moved. Really? It just has not moved. And I, and is it mostly existing homes or are you still, you guys, are they building there? They are building here. The only homes as far as listings, new listings that show up on the MLS are spec homes. So 
So a builder may have, you know, like a hundred homes in a track and he may have five that they list on the MLS just to get you in there. Oh, got it. And so it's kind of really hard to track it. You have to look at uh, building permits and stuff, but I just, I just simply, you know, share this screen here, which is what I pull off of the MLS every morning and just show you that, you know, the black line here on the bottom is new contracts. See how it's just flatlined? Yeah. And these are new listings, not, not, uh, active listings, but new as they, as they oh, come okay. on. So I, I track new listings and back on market for the ones that said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and put my house back. So you can see it just a little slight uptick over the weekend, which was surprising to me that you usually don't see an uptick on new listings on a Monday. Um, so it doesn't really mean anything. It just means we're going to muddle along, but the gap you can see between the two is growing and it's growing slowly. And that's why I had a video out, uh, you know, a few days ago that said, you know, will we hit 20,000 listings? And statistically, Dan, if we look at it today and we're adding about 400 a week to our total listing account, mm -hmm. well, that only takes 20 weeks to go from 13,000 to 20,000. Yeah. Of course, everything has to stay the same, right? You know? sales have to stay that way. They go up 400 a week. And, and so I just kind of raised the question and said, you know, could we, but rates, gosh, we, what, we got up to 7.6 and then yeah. now we're back down to 7.44 in the market. I, the market was really good this morning. And, uh, just overall the, the uncertainties in the market are what's even actually starting to freak me out because last Friday, when you were thinking the federal government was going to close down, rates actually retreated about an eighth of a percent in that day. And then we, we got the uh, government, you know, salvaged itself. And then that all that data came through. And then pre-markets, pre-market, the Dow was way up. The NASDAQ was way up. Bonds were looking real good. And then the market opened and everything just went bad again. So, I mean, you just have this whole just cloud over not only housing, but the whole economy. You know, you have the federal government. It, it's just pointing fingers like they always do. Nobody's trying. There's no resolution anywhere. Um, but, I, you know, one of the biggest things that I, I'm still and another piece of this puzzle that's freaking me out is student loan debt. And we, we talk about this all the time, but I don't think, you know, on our I, I see applications every day. You know, we have we are actually having we got applications every day. I just worked on four of them and the amount of student loan debt. You you know, if you don't have any, you, you don't fathom how much student loan debt is out there. And I did a report last week, and I think I might even mention it on your channel, is there's between 7 and $8 billion a month now that's going to be reallocated from, you know, entertainment, savings, you know, buying stuff, you know, shelter, food, services, everything else. Now it's going to be completely diverted over to student loan debt. And that's 7 to $8 billion a month in money. So when the Federal Reserve says, hey, we want, you know, the, the consumer to start slowing down, well, they're they're not really not spending or they're not cutting back on their spending. It's just where that allocation of money is going to go. And the student loan debt is, I, I, the Fed isn't stupid, but how they're not seeing this part of it, but conversely, the government debt is is crazy. So, yeah. we, you, you know, what, what the average person out there has to realize is, your the interest in the payments on your debt that you're seeing, especially housing, if you're looking to buy a new house right now or credit cards and whatever, how much has that gone up? Well, now, you know, extrapolate that out, 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 out to the government level when they're, you know, trillions of dollars in debt, when that debt servicing numbers start to uptick because of the rates are going up. It's it's devastating, to say the least. Well, and but then you go back and you look and you go, we're still. We hit 7.6 for one day. So yeah. there probably weren't a lot of loans being locked in at that right. point. Yeah. You know, they, they, they did come back down. but um, And yet prices are not falling. Um, There's just no know. supply. And everybody's like, well, the supply piece is a farce. Well, unfortunately, it's not a farce. I wish it was. You know, and so many people asked for, hey, we need, you know, the housing market to crash. I need to buy a house that, you know, I can afford and so forth. Well, you're seeing the housing market crash, but there's just nothing there. So now you don't have bidding wars. 
you know, but we still have bidding wars. If it's a house 250,000 or less, people are still, there's multiple, multiple bids. I was in Ohio this weekend for a wedding and uh, the house, house is there. I, I talked to several people. They're like, our house values, are, they're, they're nice and steady. And the tax rates here are good. Income here is, you know, our incomes are stable. So it depends on where you go in the country. You know, if you, I'm from a little town called Fallensby, West Virginia. And it's, you know, my mom's house is about $250,000, $300,000. It's a nice brick ranch. Her taxes are $1,500 a, a year. Um, so you know, it's 45 minutes from Pittsburgh. You know, if you have a house back there, it sells because people will commute back and forth to, to, to Pittsburgh. But, you know, a lot of people, so if you want an affordable house there, they are out there. Um, but you have to, you know, you can't be in Austin. You can't be in San Francisco. Um, you know, but there are places in the country that if you're a remote worker and you just want to kind of settle in somewhere, there are a lot of places right in the middle of the country and east that you can go to. So what's happening in Austin? I mean, they're like an anomaly right now. Why? Uh, I mean, they're, I get it. Their prices are coming down, but did they come down because all of a sudden more inventory showed up? And if it did, where did it come from? The and building not is happening nuts. in Phoenix. Building is nuts down in Austin. It's nuts. Um, like I was in Florida a couple weeks ago from the airport, and I've been I've been going down there for thirty years because I have a place down there. From the airport uh, to over to Cocoa Beach, that's where I have a, a place. There's a lot of building, but and I have never been to Austin. But when you talk to people in Austin, I have a lot of friends that live there, and a lot of my kids have friends that live there that who have bought house houses over the last two or three years. Uh, and they're like, I I'll buy in a crappy neighborhood two, three years ago because it is up and coming because they are building everywhere. Every, you know, if you have a little house that doesn't fit in, that's tear down and they're building up. So, you know, if you want to, you know, paint the narrative of the housing markets crashing, Austin, unfortunately, unfortunately is, is, is that market because you're, you're, they've ramped up so much and it was well needed. Uh, but now with rates hitting where they are and people are like, you know, I just can't afford that anymore. You're going to have a, a pullback in prices. And that's where I'm, I'm, all, I'm not always cheerleader of, of real estate. I said, you know, I did a, a study on Austin not too long ago. Their home values are up 200% in the last 10 years. That can't be sustained. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you have a 10% pullback in, you know, in one year, I'm not sitting there crying because it's like, guys, you just had a two. Well, and a lot of people haven't had the house for 10 years, but we're, we're always saying, and I always say on my channel, if you want a fast return, don't buy a house. The average house is going to return you maybe four or 5%, 6% in some categories, yeah. you know, but it's shelter. It's, it's a building of equity, a building of wealth. It's just over time. It just, I, you know, it's like barbecue low and slow, but if you want to just, you know, buy something and have it go up 20% in value, I, you know, God bless you, but buy cryptocurrencies or some other thing, but you're not, you know, you shouldn't get it out of housing, I guess is the best way I can put it. Yeah. And I look at uh, our median sales price here in Arizona and you can see that, you know, how it just went like this, right? Yeah, that's and then barbecue low and slow. And yeah. Then bam. And then, then bam, it went up. So, but if nothing had happened, where should we expect ourselves to be? Yep. And maybe it is right there. But, you know, nothing ever goes in straight line anyway. So if right. you're looking at coming, people are going, well, I want to get pre-pandemic pricing. Well, that would be right here. I don't see us getting to that level. Right. I you see would just us, have to have a massive sell-off. I see us getting here. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. I don't see it getting there by lunch, but I see us. It's funny that it. you it's did that because that, that's exactly how I did my analysis at the beginning of the year when I came in and says, you know, I knew, you know, I knew people weren't going to be forced into selling their homes like they did during the pan, the, during the, the, the crash, you know, in 2006. And that's what everybody pivots around, but they do usually don't explain the whys behind it. So I'm like, there, there's no, nothing really matches in the dynamics of anything other than house prices went astronomically high in a lot of areas. Um, you know, but you can't say, okay, well, they went up, you know, some areas hit 20% a year in appreciation over the last year. So the only other time in history that did that was 2008. So now we have to put those correlations together. Y you don't. What happened the last time we had the whole world shut down of COVID? What happened to prices, you know, back in 
oh, it never happened before. So <laughs> we, we don't know. And it's okay. Like I tell my kids, it's okay to say you don't know. But for everybody to come out here and say, you know, the housing market is going to crash or even on our side. I don't know that the housing market will not crash, but the so wait, there's, there's, behind it. You're saying there's no data on uh, house prices and the Spanish flu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's what I get And somebody, I was answering questions. So if, you know, if anybody watches uh, this, these videos on my channel, I answer, I, I answer usually when you per, post the first question or comment in there, I usually go in there and, and comment either thank you, or if you disagree with me or give these counter, you know, counter data, I'm always like, you please share the data with us. You know, I, I want to learn if I'm completely missing something here. But, you know, you don't have the dynamics that were in place back in 2006, which were subprime mortgages. That is the reason, that's the primary 99% reason that everything crashed at that time. Banks were crashing, investments were crashing, um, and houses just, everybody was just throwing their houses on the market because they had to get rid of them because they couldn't afford the payments. If you're in a house now, you probably have a sub four rate. Yes, your taxes and insurance might go up a little bit. Um, some areas it might go up a lot, but you know it's your loan payment isn't moving at all. So you know if you're renting and your landlord's real estate taxes just went up and their homeowners insurance just went up, well, they're obviously going to move that increase over to you. You know you the renter. Uh, so you're not, you know, sheltered from this as well. So, but the, the dynamics and everybody keep talking about, well, in 2008 it crashed. You know, it's good. It has to crash again. It, th those, those just don't add up, unfortunately. Yeah, I. It, it's still out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's just right here in front of everybody's brains. And like yeah. my comment was always, it's like your car. Just because you're going fast doesn't mean you're going to crash. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, it, so I think. So what? As we look at this week, do we have any numbers coming out? Because uh, it was interesting as I was looking last week and said, well, if we do have a federal budget shutdown, government shutdown, there won't be any numbers coming out. Yeah. But yeah. Now that they're kicking the can gleefully down the road, uh, 45 are there numbers we can expect this week? Yeah. Th this week's numbers, we have the jolt number coming out tomorrow, if I recall, is how many job openings. Uh, that's going to be interesting. Um, we have, you know, jobs report, wage reports, and everything. But unfortunately, you have to throw a lot of this out with the bathwater because in the forefront of everything is I've never seen it. And you and I aren't young. When's the last time you've seen so many unions organizing at one time striking? I mean, you go in the news um, the today. Late, and you have, the late seventies, early eighties. If so you, you were to compare this market to something, Dan, I'd go back to 1983. Got it. And yeah, that's when I graduated high school. When you look, uh, you beat me by Oh, you lagged me by 10 years. Um, so, so, um, yeah, I'm so old. Uh, so if, if you look at the numbers, you go back and look at the yeah. charts and you look at now, granted interest rates are 18%, but the impact on pricing. And when you look at where home prices went and where they're starting to go now, it almost, you know, get away from 2008 folks, go back to 1979 to 84. What and happened? Take a look at I, what I, happened then. I haven't done that analysis. Well, it's, it'll, it'll blow your mind. You can almost layer the two charts on top of each other. And then the thing is, is that back whenever you have inflation, the unions, um, push back. And so, you know, it, and, but now it's reaching this, this peak and you've got the United auto workers. I mean, what they want a 40% increase. Um, and you know, they're the push for electric vehicles are going to push a lot of them out of work anyway. So right. they're trying to grab what they can before the doors close. And, uh, and, but you see California just passed a $20 an hour minimum wage for fast food. So McDonald's is hurrying up and getting those robots, putting them in there. They, they can cook your French fries. You can order it a key. So they're that's just what my son does. Shove it That's the, he works for Berkshire Hathaway, a Berkshire Hathaway company, and he's been creating. He's he heads a team right now that's creating, trying to create a uh, basically a hamburger machine that one person operates basically the whole day. And he says, you know, the the and, and he's he's young. All my kids are you know in the mid to late twenties, might have just hit thirty. 
And they realize it too. They're like, you know, we can't afford to pay some, and you, got, you know, if you work at McDonald's, this isn't a bash against you. Um, but, you know, to be at a cash register or just putting hamburgers in a bag, it, 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 you're, you're going to have a tough time of, you know, putting a family together and feeding them and sheltering them and, and so forth. But it wasn't, I don't think it was ever intended for that. No, uh, that so he, job, you know, that, that, look, that first job is the job where you get to learn how to work with people. It's right. a, a job where somebody teaches you some skills. I mean, I was working in a gas station when I was 15 and the gentleman that uh, owned the place and his brother was a gas station. And, you know, I had to pump gas and wash windows and then, yeah. and we had, uh, um, two registers, was little, you know, tick, 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 brrr, you know, yeah. had to add things up that way. And, and that's the job where I could, I could maybe buy a car. That was, I was living with the folks cause you know, I was 15, right, but I yeah. knew when I was 16, I wanted to buy a car and that was the job after I bought my TV for 20 bucks. But that, that was now this narrative that says, well, you can't feed a family of four. Well, no, you never could. Yeah. Yeah. That you wasn't know? the intention, I think, of, of certain jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was, but, but you learn so much. I mean, there was one guy that says, you never say after you ring him up, is that it? You always go, will there be anything else? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you just, yeah. You, you might want to get yeah, that extra just, dollar out of them. You learn how to get up. You learn how to get somewhere and be on time. You learn how to interact with people. You just learn, learn stuff, you know, that schools don't teach you, didn't teach you then, and they still don't teach you today. Well, I ended up being a short or, or a, a, a cook in a restaurant in Denver. And, uh, and I went and, uh, was applying for the job, um, to drive a bread truck. Right. And they said, well, what kind of skills do you have? Do you think could relate to this? And I said, well, you ever cooked hamburgers and, uh, or scooped ice cream? And they go, no. And I, I said, I didn't think I'd ever get that skill set down, but I did. But what it tells me is I can learn anything. Got it. Yeah. And so it does have nothing to do with driving a bread truck, but just because I don't know how to do it doesn't mean I'll never know how to do it. Yeah. Great point. Great point. Let me, let me turn, if you don't mind, I know it's your show, but let me turn it around a little bit because everything is just so doom and gloom. Um, if people are out there looking to buy your first house, now again, I'm not cheerleading buying your first house or whatever. I put out a video the other day and about two weeks ago, I put out a video that I didn't think would do much and it hit like 20,000 views. Then I'm like, I, I got a good video that I'm putting together. And it was basically after you and I talked and we went over the two, one buy downs. And you said, some people said it's a farce and some people said this and that, you know, so I figured I, I would put a video together on how I would buy a house or how I would have my kids buy a house in today's market. And it, basically we, here's the, here's the, the thought behind it, or here's actually the video. If I were to buy a house in this market and I could qualify for this, this particular situation, here's what I would do. So we have there's in we have a, a two a program that will allow you to buy a house with only one percent down. Now a lot of people are saying, oh, that's you know, you, you shouldn't buy a house unless you got 20% down. You shouldn't buy well, let's assume you're trying to get into a, your first house. You don't have a lot of funds. Most programs, unless you're working with USDA and VA, you're gonna need three or three and a half percent of a down payment. So one of the programs is actually going to give you a grant for two of the 3%. It, it's, it's basically free money. And I, it's hard for me to say free money because normally nothing's free. Um, but it is, there's no tax ramifications. There's no lien on your title. There's no payment you know, that, that, that's needed back and so forth. And, you know, some people pull back on that. And then I said, well, another big element of this program is you don't have to pay PMI. And then a lot of the repercussions that I get back is, okay, well, you just jack up the rate because you can do what's called lender paid MI and all this other stuff. And I said, yeah, but that's not the case in this one. The case on this one, the rate is on average 0.23 higher than the average loan. So if you're getting lender paid MI and we can't, we won't get into the huge discussion on that. Usually the rate is much higher. Okay. So you can get into a home with you know, 1% down with no PMI. The PMI is going to save you probably on average about $100 per 100,000 that you're looking to buy, okay? So now the other thing was, is how can you, you know, you you were just saying, you know, there's there's a lot of houses coming or there's houses on the market. House prices are starting to come down. But instead of, you know, negotiating maybe lower prices for some of these things, which you can do, 
see if you can get a seller credit to get into the two one buy down. It's, it's a yeah. way to buy down your rate for the first two years. And it's not really, you know, somebody says, oh, it's not really buying down the rate. You're prepaying interest over here and things like that. Yes, that is 100% accurate. But your payment is reflective of what that 2% lower rate would be. And it gives you reprieve for at least two years. So then after that, everybody's like, okay, then, the, then you're going to have the market completely implode at that point. Well, well, no, not really, because you're actually qualifying at the higher rate and higher payments. So yeah. you're, you know what those payments are going to be. And that is capped. It's not going to move from there. But the Federal Reserve, the government, everybody's telling us the Federal Reserve is they're, they're peaked out on rates right now. Rates are probably topped out. And most likely, if you look at the dot plot for the Federal Reserve and things like that, I know we're getting into economics, but if you look at the forecast of where rates are going to be a year or two from now, they're on average about one, one and a half percent lower than we are today. So you're going to get reprieve here in the future. Um, it, these, these things cycle. So if you're young in this market and you never bought real estate and you're seeing a lot of these channels, you're not locked in. Once you buy a house, if rates come down, you can refinance at a lower rate. Um, so you have those opportunities for you. And then the other piece of that puzzle, what I was trying to explain to people is, look, folks, the housing market is not crashing. But if you want to sit on the sidelines and continue to rent, God bless you. There's nothing wrong with renting. But if you really would like to buy a house in this market, I even think, Rick, I think you have a have a link down in your description where, you know, people can reach out to us and just kick the tires. See, yeah, you know, yeah. can you qualify for a house with your credit score, your income? Do you have enough for a down payment? You know, and we'll be realistic with you. We'll just say you, you don't right now. You don't qualify. Here's, but we'll put put you in a path to say, okay, you know, here's what I would suggest you do, and, and the why's behind it. So sorry for my pitch on that, but well, it's, um, my, you know, my middle son wants to buy next year, and only because he's re-upping his rent and stuff, and he figures that he and he's saving money like crazy, so he has a goal. He's yeah. going to buy next year. He's not waiting for the market to crash. He's saying, I'm going to buy next year, dad. I, uh, I'm saving, um, you know, I, he's got a lease that doesn't come up for, you know, for another year. So he's got a sure. timeline. Yeah. Um, and the program for him, something like that would, would work out pretty well. And now if rates are really high and you can get somebody to contribute to two, two, one buy down the one, you know, I kind of was going back and forth on those, Dan, I, like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't like going into a two, one buy down because I don't like uncertainty and, here. but, but it, but if I have a payment that I qualified for, and I know that in year three, my payment's going to be X and I qualify for it. That's not uncertainty. Right. Right now. Can I refinance then? Well, that's uncertainty Yeah. because if you may not be able to refinance, if the value has gone down, too much. Right. Or is that wrong? Well, it depends. It depends on the loan product that you're in. So for example, if you're in a VA loan, a USDA loan, an FHA loan, they offer refinances as long as you've have not missed a payment in the last 12 months and your credit scores qualify you. They do not have to, you do not have to requalify based on the home's value or your income. They're saying, okay, you've made Mr. or Mrs. Homeowner, you've made your payments to us in the last two years, you've never missed a payment. So the, the reason why you're refinancing is to save money, to reduce that payment. Well, you've never missed a payment with us in the past. So if we reduce your payment, it's only going to help you. So, yeah, they, so that removes the uncertainty. I like yeah, that. Unless you have a conventional loan. So in a conventional yeah. loan, yes, you are correct. But again, the uncertainty there is you know what your maximum payment's going to be. OK, and then think about it. It's two years from now. Well, most most times and you see in the union laborers right now and everything else, most times you're getting a, a little raise every year. So if you got a two or three percent raise this year, a two or three or four percent raise next year, it probably going to put your net dollars basically where you would be today. If you get my gist of it, a yes. fourteen hundred dollar payment two years from now probably may equate out to a twelve hundred and eighty dollar payment today or twelve hundred dollar payment today based on your income that you're bringing in. Well, getting back to, you know, have you ever seen this many strikes? And when I, I'm, you know, when I was driving the bread truck, um, you know, you were paid a, a base pay plus commission. Hmm. So I was consistently getting nine, 10 percent increases in my income every year. One, because they would raise our base pay 
because of inflation. But inflation was also raising the price of the bread, of which I got a 7% commission on. So as so I was uh, I was able to buy this condo and I was really not that comfortable with the payment, but my wages kept going up. And then I got into a house and we really struggled. You know, we yeah. just scraped mm-hmm. to get the money in there. But then my wages caught up in the 80s. And yeah. now the payment that I had on that was really no big deal. There were two of us working. Um, can that happen today? We've reached an affordability wall in Arizona. So it's like, like, I wish I could say I could get into a house that stretches my payment a little bit that I could deal with. But the average person here, first time home buyers going, no, it's so far out of reach. I can't even get in now. Got it. That's our problem here in Arizona. Got it. Yep. it. Unless you drive way out past all the cactus. And uh, so, you know, they, they want to buy, but they just can't. So you really you just have no choice. You got to wait. Right. But there are people that are in a position to buy and they, and they are still buying enough to where, the difference between the supply and demand is keeping prices where they're at. And there are, I've never seen this many people collectively waiting to right. purchase. So that, that also brings me back to FOMO, you know, in the last two years ago when everybody had to buy a house there, it didn't matter if you were moving across country, everybody was moving somewhere and they were remote working and they were doing their thing. Um, but I just lost my turn of thought. <laughs> what well, were you that, just talking that about? That can happen. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I forget what no, I was talking, actually, about, talking you know, about. No, I was trying, you know, it, 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 look, if it's not affordable for you, it's not. Um, yeah, it just isn't. There's nothing. I had one young lady just mad at me because I couldn't get her qualified for a, 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 as much of a loan that, that she could find a house. And I'm like, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not the one building houses and all this other stuff. Oh, what I was getting at is there are parts of the country, which I'm, which I was saying is I go, I go a lot of places on weekends. You know, my wife and I, we have weddings all over the place with family members and stuff like that. Every time I'm there, I ask people, you know, how's housing here and how's how, yeah, you, you get there uh, some areas and they're like, dude, you can't, that, you, we're, I'll be renting forever. You know, I, I, the only way I can afford a house is if I move, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you think of moving. You know, I, I don't know, but so many people back when were moving all over the place. But if and when rates come back down, you know, they're never going to be, I won't say never, but I don't ever see them. And I hope in my lifetime, I don't see rates, 30 year fixed rates at two and a half again, because the reason why that occurred was the whole world just imploded because of COVID. Uh, so, you know, normal rates throughout history, probably five to 7%, which were a little bit higher than today. Once people get, you know, used to that, I hate to say it that way, is it won't, you know, we're, we're so, you know, addicted to that where rates were and how cheap everything was that when we're getting back to normal times, um, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's hard. It's like just, yeah, you know, I snacking see. every night on candy. And then all of a sudden you, you realize you got diabetes and you got to stop eating it. It's like, it's hard. But then after, you know, you, you go through that length of time, it's like, oh, okay, this isn't, it's another lifestyle of mine. Yeah, I had a comment on my channel once said, I got a loan at 2.75. When do you think I'll be able to refinance for a lower rate? And I said, um, never. Never. <laughs> you know, keep it. Well, that's why even, you know, I have 2.625 on my house. My son, he has a house. He's at 2.625 too. I refinance him when I did on did my loan. Now he's like, you know, his income keeps going up. He works, like I said, for Berkshire Hathaway company. He's an engineer creating machines for McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's. And his income keeps going up and up and up. And now he's like, you know, I might rent my house because my house payment is, I mean, it's under rent market rents. He's like, I could probably charge two times what my house payment is and rent it and then take that overage and help me, you know, you know, help me with my new mortgage on a house that I'd really like to build. And so those are, and, but again, it, it goes into that wheelhouse that that house now is not going on the market to be sold. It's going to be rented because he has a tough time, you know, walking away from a house with that cheap of a house payment, unless he needed the money for the next house, which he doesn't, God bless him, is, you know, he can keep that house as an investment. Well, you know? I remember the early nineties when interest rates started going back down. Um, yeah. This was before caller ID and, uh, and before the internet, this is like 93, I think. And, uh, and so lenders were always calling at dinner time. Oh, I know. And Are I was one of the ones calling. Gone down? 
every stinking day get through the, it got down to where i you know i'd answer my phone and i go hello i'm happy with my current mortgage and then they would just click <laughs> I, I was one of them to... that's how i made a living on the phone well, yeah you don't know, blame them but you years. know you had to get the word out right yeah but i'm yeah. thinking you know if you don't know the rates have gone down by now i got yeah. i mean it's amazing how every time the phone was ringing like it's just yeah. dad or is this a lender okay I got, yep. hey, hello <laughs> believe it or not if you watch a lot of you know tv now and youtube you don't you, is a first time home buyer, you might not understand that you can refinance. I, I mean, the, the way the, they make it sound like is you, you buy this house today at these rates and you, you, that's, that's what you got forever, you know, and it's, it's not that way. And people just don't understand it. And what drives me crazy and we can leave it kind of at this buying a house is an, is a huge investment. And it's not just something that you just, you know, jump into, hope to God it works. And if it doesn't, you know, whatever, it's a huge investment, probably the biggest investment you're going to make in your life. So, you know, you're not going to, or you shouldn't be getting astronomical returns on it, but it is intended for shelter for you and your family to live. And, you know, over time you will gain, you know, wealth, not well, you might not get wealthy, but you'll gain equity into that home. Uh, for some, you know, is a, is a possibly retirement piece of your puzzle in real estate um, at some point. But, you know, it's it, so many people just want those returns like this. And it's like, again, there's other yeah. markets for that. If you're looking to buy a house, I'm a proponent. I would say if you're not going to be there, it minimally, minimally bare bones three years. And if you don't know, then don't buy, you yeah, know, yeah. when in doubt, do more, without. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, Dan, thanks for Keeping us updated, we're going to watch the job numbers this week. See what happens. Glad the government's uh, hasn't shut down. And, you know, and maybe I'm not too. I'm kind of torn on that one. But uh, oh, just it'll be. Here's the bad thing about it. It'll be uh, just sh shambles for the next month and a half that we got to live through every day. And now all the politicians are going to jump in, and everybody's at fault. And then you look at it, and you're like, well, you've been in government for 20 years, and you haven't really done anything. Yeah, um, yeah, but you're blaming politicians. <laughs> yeah, you're blaming politicians, but you've been a you know basically a politician your whole life, and it's still messed up. So who you're really blaming? Yeah, no kidding. Jeez. Oh so, well, that's a whole nother show. Yep. Well, All right, Dan, man. Thanks for joining Appreciate me, my it, buddy. friend. Take care. You Bye. betcha. Take care. Bye bye.